The Rush, sponsored by State Farm. Welcome to the Rush season finale. As always, I'm Danny Fry. On the final Rush episode of the season, the baseball teams played at Southeast twice. We had girls and boys track highlights along with CSA boys tennis. And right now, let's start the program. The Glenwood baseball team was looking to keep pace at the top of the CS8 on the road against Southeast. Let's take a look at the highlights courtesy of channel 1450.com. Mike Ringer on the mound. He was on fire. Their call strike three and gets him looking there. That was Michael Hudson and then Jonah Bell down on strikes. Ringer was rolling throughout this game. I believe he totaled 13 strikeouts. The Southeast bats eventually got going, but here's some Glenn with defense up the middle. Jack Atterbury with the 6-3 almost put out ball. Gets away on the throwing air. Cruising in to score is Zach Weaver. And now Jaron Janicek at the plate. It is over the head of Sam Anderson. A run cruises in for the Spartans. That made it 3-0. And Ringer still on fire, strikes out Hobby, strikes out Squibb in the sixth inning. And then they bring on Herman Senor, who would start the next night to close it out. A little trouble, but then he would strike out three straight tight end batters, including Jonah Bell swinging to end the game. Titans leave the bases loaded, and Southeast wins 3 to nothing. Four hits for both teams. Ringer, six innings pitch, 12 strikeouts. Jaron Janicek had that key RBI double in the late innings. The Titans look for revenge against the Spartans Wednesday night at South Park. Let's take a look at the final result here. Glenwood wins 4-2, 11 hits, Brian Hobby, 7 innings pitched, 8 strikeouts, 3 hits, 2 runs batted in. Glenwood Baseball hosts Lanphier tonight at 4.30 for senior night and open regional play Wednesday against the winner of Quincy Notre Dame and Springfield High at Sacred Heart Griffin in the SHG Class 2A Regional. The Glenwood girls track team, they were in postseason mo mode at sectionals last Thursday at GHS, but the meet was hosted by Jacksonville. The boys track team was in the hunt for the conference crown at the CS8 meet. That was Friday night here at Glenwood. Here's a guest anchor is senior sprinter Kwamer McNair. Thanks for coming on again, Kwamer. Thank you for having me again. So, Kwamer, uh, going in, how, so how has this uh, track season uh, been going on both of the girls and the boys side? Um, the girls have been doing a lot better. They're actually going to state, and yes. that's pretty good. The boys, we're looking pretty good for uh, sectionals today. Yeah, and you'll find out tonight. And we'll, we'll find out tonight how it's going to go, but we, we have a good chance of going to state this year in multiple teams, like 4x4, uh, 4x8, four by four, four by 4x2, so I think we're looking pretty good this year. All right, let's jump into the girls' sectional highlight. This was last Thursday night. We'll start with the field events. Ellie Alexander already broke the school discus record twice there. She ended up being third of a, a throw of 115 and uh, that would be good enough to qualify her for state. We move on to the 4x800 relay. The Titan girls got third, a time of 9.55.10. Uh, Rachel Crowley starting it off. Uh, Coach Garber getting them inspired. Uh, don't you like yeah, Coach Garber? Yeah. And uh, uh, Erica Rideout finishes it out with uh, yeah, Coach Garber always able to get uh, his guys and girls inspired. And uh, how much relief after a relay like that? You see Rachel Crowley talking to Erica right out. Yeah, it's a, it was a big relay. They did a, they did really good. I, I saw that race. It was, it was a really good. Race. This four by one hundred is also a great race. Of course, you have Charday Crawford going to finish this one out in the four by one hundred. Jasmine Jackson, arguably one of the fastest sprinters on the Global Girls team, she's right up with Charday Crawford. Eventually, Charday Crawford going to edge out the Titan four by one hundred relay gets second at sectionals when you lose to a southeast relay you're still doing something right lindsey rogers in the 3200 meter run uh, 11 25 top time and uh, there's coach garber again and she's able to uh cruise to first place talk about lindsey rogers what Lindsay, she's able to do lindsey's such a phenomenal athlete she's a very good runner she's put put our distance team up there in the girls she's 
In the 400 meter dash, time of 55 seconds, Jasmine Jackson able to win that. And uh, as a team, the Tynes finished third of 66 Southeast, smoking the competition with 146 SHG rounding out the top five at sectionals. But you guys then the very next day, obviously girls team fared well. Yep. And then uh, the guys team coached by Coach Onkin, and we'll get to him a little later after the uh, highlight. But uh, going into that CS8 meet, what was really going through your mind? You were in a part of a big uh, 4 by 200 relay. Uh, what was going through my mind? Just honestly, the win, the win in CS8, the win conference, that was the biggest thing. I would do anything to win conference, and that's what we did. So that was what was in my mind. Let's take a look how you guys accomplished that here at the boys CS8 track meet. Start out with Mark Maton, 3200. He's more of a competitor in the 1600. He sort of cruised this one to his standards, 10.01. Yeah. Still claims first in the CS8. Talk about Blake Harden, and he's really come out of the blue this year. 800, he wins the time of 202. Good, he's <laughs> just like, fast. Yeah, he is. Talk about this right here, 4x200 relay. You guys are at the bottom right, when Rocky hands the baton off you and you fly and able to make up that ground. What was going through your mind when you got the baton? I was just, in my mind, I was just run. Just run fast, come on, Mary, just run fast, that's it. And then uh, Trevor Dow able to finish out the relay. Titans win that one. And right at that point in the meet is really when the tide started to turn a little bit for you guys. Now this is when Mark Maton going for the school record. He was one second off. He needed 424, he had 425, but still a great effort. He cruises to the CSA title in the mile. And uh, just so close. And then Michael Giovanelli, you guys really leaned on him. Talk about that as he won the 200. We put so much, we put a huge load on Michael. We've been putting a huge load on him lately, but he's been, he's been taking it. He's a Giovanelli, he can run, so. That's right, yeah. Tony and Joey, yeah. uh, the Italian Stallions was their nickname. 4 by 400 relay, you guys already claim the title for the CSA by this point, but then of course, who else to finish off uh, this great meet but Michael Giovanelli finishing off the 4x4 four four. and guys end up uh, cruising in this meet um, over Springfield High in the end to win 154 over 130. Uh, Jacksonville ended up finishing in fourth in the CS8 meet. Here are some post-game sounds. Well, those last uh, last four events really turned up huge. I, I tell you, when the, when the big factor came in the um, 300 hurdles. When when we went two, three in the 300 hurdles with Nathan and Luke, um, that really kind of set the tone. And then uh, you know, then you have the 1600, and, you, and you, then you have the uh, the 200 with Michael winning that. And then we come out and win the four by four. I mean, that you know, that's just a really, really great performance by our kids. Uh, championship effort, championship performance. Went out for the two mile. Uh, coaches had me in there for points for the team. Uh, kind of laid back until. The, uh, the mile marker here and there and threw on a little bit of a surge for three laps and then just kind of came into the mile and then just wanted to kind of blow it out. Uh, we just have to, you know, everything had to go our way at the end and, and it did. Our kids made it go that way. Um, that's the kind of kids we have here though. You know, they work hard and uh, they'll do whatever I ask them to do. And uh, they, they act like champions, they, they compete like champions and, and now they are champions. Back on the set here, Kwamir for the sectionals. I and mean, winning the CSA was one thing in the come behind fashion, but what are you guys expecting for a girls section or for guys sectionals rather? Uh, it's at Memorial Stadium tonight, and uh, what are you guys expecting? Uh, uh, some great competition again. Yeah, really good competition. We're not really like, we're not going out there to win the sectional as like a whole team. We're just going out there to place people. We want to place as many runners at state as possible. So we're hoping to place our 4x2, 4x4, 4x8, hopefully Maton in the uh, 16 and 32. Perko and Hack and the uh, 110s and 300. So we're hoping to get a lot of, we're trying to get our whole team to state. This is what, that's what our goal is. You're in the four by two. What do you think the chances are to qualify there? Our chances to qualify? I think we have a pretty good chance of qualifying the four by two. If we, we can get first at sectionals tonight, if our handoffs are perfect. If our handoffs are perfect, we could do very well. And we could possibly place a state with good hand wow. Well, uh, good luck uh, with right, sectionals you. tonight and hopefully state at EIU. Thanks. Thanks. All right, girls, state was yesterday at Eastern Illinois University. Boys track and field sectionals are tonight with events starting at 415 in Memorial Stadium in Springfield. Let's take our first commercial break of the day and we'll return with girls soccer and tennis highlights. Stay tuned.
Fat Willie's in Chatham is a great family restaurant that supplies a wonderful dining experience. We offer outstanding fried chicken and over-the-top walleye and pizza. With quality products at affordable prices, Fat Willie's is the way to go. Open Monday through Saturday, 12 a.m. to midnight. Call us today at 217-483-6969. Aaron, you're all set. Great, thanks. Mike, thanks for doing that discount double check. You saved us hundreds. What was that? The discount double check? It's when we comb through your policies to make sure that you're getting all the discounts you deserve. No, I get that part, but you guys are doing my move. The discount double check move? It's my touchdown dance. So you're a dancer? No, I'm a quarterback. Oh, quarterback. More. I'm a robot. <laughs> <laughs> get out of here. Get to a better state, State Farm. Call Steve Bedford in Chatham for personal service and discounts that you deserve. Kids, the breakfast is ready. Eat up. Your friend's gonna be here pretty soon. I'll be there in a second. Have a great day. My friend's here, I'm leaving. Be safe, come home right after school. All right, see ya. Wow, your dads are really looking out for you. That's not my dad. That's my family's financial advisor, Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan Financial, looking out for your investments and your family. The Glomo Girls soccer team earned a number one seed in their own regional and opened up against fourth seeded Jerseyville, the Panthers. Let's take a look at the highlight. The boys team played them in the regional final. This is a regional semi. Abby Clintworth right off the bat gets it over to Ashley Musgrove, but a save by the Panther goalie. And here time's going to strike first. Brendel Marshall off of the hands of the goalkeeper, couldn't handle it. One nothing Glenwood early on in this one. It would be a route. Fancy throw in right there, but that's about as fancy as Jersey will, Jerseyville will get. Shot on goal, but Mara, Mara Cunningham, hey, I said Mara that time, able to stop it. And then another shot on goal. Here is senior Maya Habibi, but eventually scooped up by the Jerseyville goalkeeper. Now some seniors. This was considered senior night, even though it was a regional semifinal due to all the rainouts. Kayla Torrey is going to get on the scoring action there, up for 90 with the score. And then Again, Ashley Musgrove right here. Dagger! And another goal for the Lady Titans. They cruise in this one 10 to nothing over the Jerseyville Panthers in the regional semi. Two, goal, two goals by Graves, Marshall with a goal and assist. Here are some post-game sounds. Well, I think the girls did well. It's difficult. Uh, sometimes first round matchups. Uh, we just played a team that was not ready, you know, not at our level. Uh, their coaches, they had them well coached and they're giving a good effort, but uh, you know, sometimes you get those matchups early on. You just want your kids to come out and play hard and play our level of soccer and not down to the opponent's level. And I think we did a good job. We weren't too emotional because we know that we have some more games left now, but it was definitely uh, bittersweet knowing that we've been playing with this same girl since we were like four and now we're seniors, so it was awesome. Uh, you know, we're going to stay and watch Jacksonville and see what they have, but Hopefully we're just going to stay focused this week and go out and beat Jacksonville. The Lady Titans battle for the regional title tonight at 5.30 here at GHS. Many Americans watch or play sports for entertainment. However, the major leagues, specifically the MLB, are becoming increasingly violent, which may be affecting aspiring athletes. GCNN's Hannah Duncan has more. Recently, Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher Zach Greinke hit Carlos Quentin of the San Diego Padres with a pitch, and he assumed it was intentional. Quentin rushed the mound, resulting in a fight between the two benches and Greinke's broken left collarbone. Quentin got an eight-game suspension, while Greinke will be out because of his injury for about eight weeks. When relating to high school sports, Illinois High School Association's Craig Anderson states, these actions would never be acceptable at the high school level. 
I believe the same is true at the professional level. I think the suspension penalty Quentin received reinforces this notion. While Anderson agrees with the penalty, Skip Schumacher of the Los Angeles Dodgers did not think it was enough. He states, he has been hit more times in the past five years than any other player. It was the seventh inning, and the last thing we want to do is put a guy on base when we are only winning by a run. I believe Quentin should have been suspended for as long as Grinke is out with his injury. The incident at the Dodgers game is not uncommon in pro games. The reason for that may relate to the fact that in the major leagues, baseball is a paying job. Those guys are there to, to make a living, and if, uh, if a pitcher thinks somebody's crowding the plate on them a little bit, they're... They feel like they're taking money out of their pocket if they let them do that. So they crowd them off the plate, and the hitter doesn't want that to happen. And one thing leads to another. While there are many issues with sportsmanship at the pro level, high school sports do not have those same issues. You know, we don't emphasize it a whole lot. But I've been very fortunate with the uh, players I've had at Glenwood that they pretty, do a pretty good job of self-policing that, and I don't have to deal with it too much. Glenwood hardly ever sees fighting at sporting events. Coaches restrain their players, and the athletes are well aware of the dangers of getting involved. They could get in trouble, or they could be injured like Zach Greinke. Most players understand that, so they don't start fights. They also hear a statement before every game. Read an IHSA sportsmanship uh, statement. PA announcers are supposed to read that before uh, every sporting event is a, a sportsmanship statement, sort of like uh, the umpires will make a call like this for a reason, and uh, just to respect each other. And so, no, the coaches do a great job to hold them back. Glenwood does not have many issues with violence, and that is similar with other high schools. Craig Anderson states, Fortunately, we rarely see fights in high school sports. I believe this is because of the high level of emphasis on sportsmanship put on the athletes by their coaches. When asked about the impact that fights in the pro level have on high school athletes, Anderson also states, Personally, I don't think it has an effect on the actions of the high school players. High school players recognize the need to demonstrate positive sportsmanship in their competition, and this is how players are instructed by their coaches. For GCNN, I'm Hannah Duncan. Zach Greinke returned Wednesday in a 3-1 Dodgers win. The Titan boys tennis team tried to three-peat as CSA champions. Here to break down the highlight is Glenwood Jr. tennis player Vader Rodderaman. Vader, thanks for coming up. Thanks for having me. Okay, so uh, talk about it. You're heading into uh, the CSA meet and you had a beat by SHG beforehand. What are you guys are trying to do? Uh, I think we had a couple of shakeups in the lineup and we were just trying to finish as well as we could and I think Finishing second was pretty good for the lineup that we had. All right, let's take a look at the highlight here. The boys CSA tennis meet. And start here with uh, Eric Hudek and Greg uh, Matos. And uh, they unfortunately lost your 6-4, uh, 6-2, but they were able to uh, fight uh, with uh, Graham Cross, who's a very good tennis player over at uh, SHG's side. They were able to get some points here early, like there's a nice move by uh, Eric Hudak right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually though, uh, SHG able to back out of it. Talk about this move right right here, able to uh, volley it back over. Talk about that right there, nice form. Well, Greg and Eric were just trying to you know, get the ball back, and they just lobbed it up to him and put it away pretty well. Uh, an easy win for Nick Cock and Roban Zahid right here. This one tap back and the, does that happen just time, sometimes they just run into each other? Yeah, so. they just weren't playing their best tennis, but they didn't really need to because they weren't had had too much good competition. Yeah, that's right. This save able to uh, a boot over and that one eventually uh, win over a little long shot there. Springfield High. They lost the Talk about your, your, your single match. You're able to cruise 6-1. 6-2, just uh, not trying to do too much. Yeah, just right? trying to conserve some energy for the later matches in the day. And uh, that's eventually pretty much what you did here. You got a lot of help from your competition knocking it out too, right? Yeah. So you guys ended up uh, getting second here in the CS8 meet. 23 and a half, 21 and a half. You guys, I'm finishing second, SHG first. Thanks for coming on, Vader, and uh, good luck in sectionals. Okay, thanks, Andy. The Glenwood Boys tennis team has sectionals tonight and tomorrow at Washington Park. The Glenwood softball team squared off twice against Southeast. Let's see how they performed. 25 nothing win over Southeast. Sammy Long, three hits, three runs batted in. Allison Long, five innings pitched, six Ks on the bump. And then in the 
Second game at home, 17 to nothing. Two hits for Hudson, seven strikeouts for Madison Bandy. The softball Titans play Lamphere tonight at 4.30. Let's take our last commercial break of the season. We'll be right back for the weekly debate with Austin Kim and Zach Kirker. Well, Mr. Raji, we could save you hunters by doing a discount double check. Not you too, Raji. You're on my team. You know that's my move. The discount double check? No, that's my touchdown dance, man. Here we go again. Sir, you're not even doing it right. Raji, drop it. Show me what you got, what you got, Raji. What is this? Come on now. You said you were a dancer. Where are you going, buddy? Come on back. Get to a better state. State Farm. Call Steve Bedford in Chatham for personal service and discounts that you deserve. Welcome back to The Rush. It is now time for the last debate of the season here for the weekly debate. Zach Kirker of Channel 1450.com and WCIA 3's Austin Kim. Guys, thanks for coming on for the final debate of the season. You're not taller than I am. No, 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 no. How do I bring this up? How do I bring this up? This is rigged. This is rigged. I don't want to be short. I don't want to be shorter. There we go. There we go. Okay. A little bit. I'll just stand up on my tippy toes. Well, guys, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule covering spring sports right now. Now the busiest season on here for a debate. Uh, no problem. Yeah. Anything for you guys. All right. Thank you. We'll start. And uh, this is a, the only question you guys know ahead of time. The rest will be completely genuine. They did not see them before. So let's go right into the debate with the NBA uh, playoffs. Mike Grizz just pulled off a win uh, in overtime against OKC to uh, bring it to 3-1. But what is your NBA Finals prediction? Let's start with Austin Kimmel. We'll go down to Zach. Obviously, it's the Bulls, and Derrick Rose is going to be your MVP. No, <laughs> uh, maybe it's Sue, the GQ, back. you know, my GQ MVP right On there. On the side. I mean, really, let's be honest. I mean, the Heat has to be the favorite, right? Because, you know, LeBron, D. Wade, you know, all those guys. I, They're I, unstoppable. I can't they think of a team with th that much talent and that can really bring it together like like the Heat can. And until someone tells me otherwise, uh, the Heat are, are, are my favorites. Yeah. It doesn't matter what your Grizz do. It doesn't matter it doesn't. what anybody <laughs> does. The Heat are <laughs> going right. to win. It's I've watched about four minutes of NBA playoffs this year. I typically watch a whole bunch, but I don't see any point to watch this year because it's basically a done deal already, especially with Westbrook, with Westbrook going down in the West. There's no Nobody's going to beat the Heat. Yeah, you know, maybe You're we right. should just enjoy it. You know, let, see, take Take LeBron, don't take LeBron for granted. Just enjoy it. You know, appreciate the athlete that he is because he is he is just a stud he's, on the court. I agree Especially he's the he greatest. I agree he's the greatest, yeah. but I, I'm not here to celebrate LeBron. I'm not. I just, you know, I, hey, I, you I respect. Here? I got respect. But I'm, I'm not here to I'm not here to celebrate LeBron. Oh, I will at least. You will. All right. So you're the Colin Cowherd then, praising. LeBron. Sure, with just a lot less hair. <laughs> that is true. And great. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, NBA Finals, we uh, come to a conclusion. Heat will win that, which I don't see where it wouldn't be the case. Now, here we go. Completely uh, genuine answers from here on out. With West Lunt recently oh. decided to leave uh, uh, Oklahoma State. He was recruited there by uh, Monken, who's now the head coach at Southern Miss, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, Gundy sort of put him, uh, him, Shelf, and then Walsh all at the same, and then eventually he backed out, which probably the right decision for him out there. He's a sophomore now. Where will he transfer to? Any chance for Illinois? Obviously, with a Euro Illini Nation here, Austin Kim with the hook of WCAA 3. Austin, what do you think the chances of where Len will go and uh, chances at Illinois? Well, yeah, I think Illinois has got a great chance. I mean, when you think about him having an offer from Western Michigan when Bill Kubit was the head coach. Yes. Bill Kubit is obviously the offensive coordinator yeah. for Illinois. He already had an Illinois, Illinois offer when Ron Zuck and his regime was still there. Right. I, I can't imagine that uh, Illinois would, you know, take this one not so seriously. They're going to put the full court press on Munt. Alex Golish and, and all those guys have a really good rapport with Derek Leonard at Rochester. I'm sure they're going to have a really good rapport with uh, the Lunt family. Um, I think you know Illinois is in a is in a good position. Not saying it's a, it's they're it, he's going to go there, but I think they're in a good position. I sure. think I think that they are in a good position, a much better position than I originally thought yes. that they were actually. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that West would like to be closer to home um, and Rochester. Right. And this is what it comes down to. Your four realistic options are Southern Miss, which is where Coach Munkin is. 
I, I think that's going to be too far away from home, and it's a program rebuilding. I think that's not going to be heard, an option. I heard from Sports Radio 1450 and Kevin O'Day that that was not a likely option. I, I mean, Munkin guys. put the hard court press on, got him one time. I'm not saying he can't do it again, but I think it's sure. the least likely of his real options. Vanderbilt was in it until late in his original choice. They're still in it again. That's SEC football. I Tennessee, think, I saw, was in there in the mix. Don't, no, don't worry about I don't Tennessee. Think Tennessee. Right, don't yeah. worry about Tennessee. I was thinking one Tennessee, Tennessee no, possibly. Louisville and Illinois is who it's going to come down to. Louisville throws the ball a ton. Yeah. They're a, a program that was in a BCS Bowl this past year. I think it comes down to Louisville and Illinois. Louisville's got a, a Heisman candidate quarterback who will be leaving for the NFL after this year, which Wes is going to have to sit anyway. And then it's wide open for him. And, why, and if you're if you're Wes, why not go to Louisville where you can learn under a Heisman candidate, right. Teddy Bridgewater? He came That's on the right. scene late in the season. Season, he's going to have a, g a good year this year, sure. barring injury. Why not? And I think yeah. at the end of the day, Illinois is going to be in the running, and he's going to give them a hard look because they are just down the road and because of the Cubit connection yeah. and all that. But at the end of the day, where's Beckman going to be? No, it's Illinois. Well, and that's that's yeah. actually the fact that Beckman might be gone is actually yeah. probably a good thing for this whole okay. situation. That's Cubit. what. But but what I'm telling you is, is that they haven't hit a recruit, a big recruit. Since Beckman's been there, there's not a lot of talent no. for West to throw to. Uh, at the end of the day, it's Illinois, and Illinois is one of the bottom teams in one of the worst BCS conferences in football in the nation. It's it's just it's, I just don't I think reality sets in. I do not see it. I, did, I disagree with the with the with the Beckman point and the fact that if he gets West Lunt, this buys him another year. It, it might. It, 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 this buys him another year because okay. I pers I personally thought that see Beckman what he would, does with if, him. Is, if if they didn't make a move, I felt like Beckman could very well be gone after this season. With Wes, you could say, hey, give me another year. I can do something with this. He has to sit out of here. Let me, you know, let me fix this. And he's going to get another year. I still yeah. don't think it's yeah. Illinois, though. I think it's yeah. Well, let's go. Uh, this is going to be the final question, but this is uh, more relaying to your guys' job with uh, what, sport, what team, what area uh, do you guys like covering uh, the best this year? What mm. team is really uh, sort of jumped out at you guys? Just Spring have, sports or all Well, you know, year. you can go all around, all, all all year round, uh, what sport? What, no matter what, what level, or what? High. Yeah, what level? Whatever you want. I was kind of narrowing it towards high school, but if you if there's another team that you really obviously Illinois for you. Oh, you know, for me it yeah. has to be that Illinois basketball yeah. team. The fact that they've been able to come up with this NCAA tournament run, the fact that they were able to to beat Colorado, they should have you know had the opportunity beat to Miami. to beat Miami had not been for that call. Um, that that didn't go Illinois' way. Yeah. Um, but it's just a fun. It was a fun team to watch in the sense that you know they had senior leadership. They had players that could knock down big shots between Tyler Griffey, uh, Brandon Paul, and that that class. The storylines with that with that team were just very intriguing. You had John Gross, who was in his first year. Uh, at, Such a classy coach. A, a, exactly, and, and then staff in general gets it. That staff in general just gets it. So the fact that they've been able to build hype. Um, through this uh, on this program, not just during the season, but this year with with recruiting and all that, they're building a buzz, and that's going to be so good. And with the fact that they've gotten the new naming rights, it's not Assembly Hall anymore; State it's Farm State Center. Farm Center. The the whole new. They're getting transfers. Uh, this is a team that's just fun to cover. They the kids themselves um, think represent the university well. They haven't gotten any in trouble, and I think from a public relations standpoint and just from a fan standpoint, it, it's fun to be an Illini basketball fan now. Do they land the Okafor kid? No, but I think I, I I think they go. Isn't he gonna land somebody though? Isn't he Cliff gonna Alexander, get one of those I think guys? Cliff Alexander, for what I've been told, is gonna be uh, their number one target, and then you know maybe if they get a, a Jaquan Lyle or maybe even a, a Larry Austin, um, you know that oh, be yeah. that that be great for Illinois. But I think they want a big. And they need they, a big. They, they need a big. Um, and I think if they get a premier one like Cliff, that's going to do wonders for them down the road in terms of getting sure. future recruits. As future soon as they get that around. next big name, it's going to it's gonna do exactly what happened to Indiana with the Zellers and, and yes. those guys. Yes. You're going to see the, the dominoes yep. fall. So I agree. It's exciting to have Illinois basketball. You guys did a great job covering that, by the way. There are, there are two teams that stand out for me at the high school level yes, that I've covered channel. this past year. One obviously has to be the Rochester football team who three-peated. The fact that they basically just keep plugging in a new quarterback and keep doing what they're doing says uh, a ton about what Derek Leonard's able to do. His last five quarterbacks have played Division I football. So think about that yeah. for a minute. That, what is the one common denominator out there? Will it's, Lunt, Sean Robinson, Wes Lunt, 
Out, uh, Austin, Austin Green, Green. And, the Green. Kid, and the kid who was the quarterback yes. before those guys is yes. play, played D1 football as well. I forgot. The so, yeah, so, yeah, so that's the, the common denominator is Derek Leonard. So to have a coach in town who's getting attention from D1 programs that, that would like to have him be on staff, there, right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's exciting to watch what he's done. He's revolutionized the way that high school football is yes, played in the state yeah. of Illinois. It really has. They, there's nobody else that can match what they do. Well, thanks, guys. Again, Austin Kim from WCIA 3. You can uh, watch him on weeknights with uh, different uh, packages and anchoring a little bit as well. And Zach Kirker, always log on to www.channel1450.com. Right. Shameless plug right there. <laughs> and that's all we have for this season of The Rush. I want to thank CJ Carmine, who co-directed the show this season with me. Uh, reporter and cameraman Gavin Caruso, always sacrificing his time to cover sports. Reporters Erica Moser, Josh Camacho, Eric Burkle also did a great job on teleprompter. A special thank you to all the players and coaches who were guest anchors this season. And of course, and thank you to all of our debate guests and most importantly, our loyal viewers. Yes, you guys. That's it for this season of The Rush. We will see you next season. We on. Here comes it. Here comes it. Here comes it. Here comes it. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah.